Good evening, dear Mr. Howard, distinguished guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Benny Peiser. As the director of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's GWPF annual lecture. It's my particular pleasure to welcome John Howard, former Prime Minister of Australia, who has traveled here from Down Under specifically to deliver the fourth annual GWPF lecture. John Howard is no newcomer to the debate about global warming and what governments consider doing about it. In fact, he's one of the pioneers of climate policy, although his landmark advance is not widely known. In 1998, 15 years ago, uh, as then Prime Minister, John Howard established the Australian Greenhouse Office, which was then the world's first government agency dedicated to cutting greenhouse gas emissions. On the thorny issue of international climate policies, however, his position has been consistent throughout the years. In a foreword to one of our reports, he wrote, I'm agnostic when it comes to global warming. That is why I had no difficulty in proposing in 2007, when I was Prime Minister of Australia, an emissions trading system predicated on the rest of the world acting in a similar fashion and designed to protect Australia's trade ex exposed industries. For many years, Green campaigners criticized his insistence on an international legally binding agreement. They pointed to Europe, where governments had no hesitation whatsoever to burden their own countries with unilateral and therefore hugely expensive climate policies. Tonight, Mr. Howard returns to London in the full knowledge that his principled opposition to go-it-alone policies has become the new consensus, even among EU member states that only a few years ago acclaimed their avant-garde approach. In fact, the European Union itself has now adopted the Howard Doctrine, warning that the EU will not sign to any new climate treaty that does not include major economies such as China, India, um, the US and others. Ladies and gentlemen, the last year has seen a deepening crisis of British and international climate policies. All over Europe, energy prices are going through the roof, fuel poverty is rising, costly green energy policies are facing a growing public backlash. Even the Prime Minister, for the first time, is having second thoughts. In Australia, Mr. Howard's friend and colleague, Tony Abbott, became the new Prime Minister on the back of an election promised to abolish the hugely unpopular carbon tax. At the same time, the new government has abolished the Climate Change Department, has abolished the Climate Change Commission and other sections of the green bureaucracy. John Howard was one of the first and foremost critics of the Kyoto Protocol that only required European and a few other nations to cut CO2 emissions. Uh, in February 2005, the very day the Kyoto Protocol came into effect, John Howard reaffirmed Australia's opposition to what he called a useless treaty and stressed that joining Kyoto would mean major nations, including China, India, Indonesia, and uh, the United States would not be subject to the same economic restrictions Australia would face. That, he warned, would jeopardize Jap uh, Australian jobs and industry. He was right all along. The Kyoto Protocol turned out to be a dead end. It expired unlamented at the end of last year without any legally binding follow-up treaty. Yet for many years, John Howard was criticized for his restrained approach to climate change he has repeatedly condemned the intellectual bullying which has been a feature of the behavior of some climate zealots. He certainly um, has not been intimidated, stressing, and I quote, the attempt of many to close down the climate debate is disgraceful and must be resisted. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, the Honorable John Howard. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Benny Pisa, uh, Lord Nigel Lawson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the Foundation for asking me to 
come to London uh, to deliver this address. I do so with uh, considerable enthusiasm and I've deliberately chosen um, the title for the lecture, uh, One Religion is Enough, um, uh, to highlight um, my belief that part of the problem with this debate is that to some of the zealots in the debate, uh, their cause has become a substitute religion. And although not given to agnosticism in other matters, uh, I have for a long time been uh, an agnostic on the issue of climate change or global warming, and I will use the expressions interchangeably to reinforce my agnosticism uh, on the subject. The other particular relevance of being able to deliver this lecture tonight is that as um, Dr Pisa mentioned, we've just had a change of government in Australia. And yes, hear, hear. Um, <laughs> it's been a magnificent change of government and one that uh, I welcome not only for the obvious philosophical reason that we now have a sound centre-right government in charge in Australia, uh, but also for the reason that the new Prime Minister is somebody for whom uh, I have a very warm personal regard and uh, we have been colleagues for a long time. He was a senior minister in my government and I think he'll do an outstanding job. But enough of that. The real significance is that, as uh, Dr Pisa pointed out, uh, a central issue in the election campaign was the different approach of Tony Abbott and the Liberal Party uh, in Australia uh, from that of the Labor Party on the issue of global warming. Uh, and it uh, is the case that had it not been for Tony Abbott uh, seeking the leadership of the Liberal Party four years ago because he disagreed uh, with the party pursuing a bipartisan agreement with the Labor government on the issue of climate change, um, we would probably still have a Labor government in Australia uh, some four years later. Tony Abbott's uh, stance on climate change uh, uh, was central to his election campaign. But let me uh, just traverse for a moment before I return to the Australian scene uh, some of my um, broader views about this very important debate. One of the things that I have found most aggravating about the debate is the attempt by so many people who have a particularly zealous view on the issue to intimidate policy makers into compliance with their point of view by asserting that this is not really an issue that is anything other than something to do with the science. We are constantly told that the science is in, uh, that the debate is over, uh, there can be no further um, serious debate about the scientific propositions. Now all of us know as common sense individuals that the science is never completely in on any subject and the whole basis of understanding the importance of science to our lives is that the, it is a source uh, of information uh, derived from intelligent inquiry uh, it's not a piece of political advocacy. And we all know of examples where we believe that the science was in on something uh, only to discover uh, later on that uh, further research has indicated that another point of view um, ought to prevail. The issue of global warming is a public policy issue. Uh, the science is important. It's important to understand the science of the debate. It's also important to understand the economics of the debate. And it's also important to understand that, is, that as public monies are involved, the ground is thick with rent seekers uh, who would like to have a share uh, of that public money. I'd like to read for you a quote uh, from the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons, 
by Richard Lindsden, the Emeritus Professor of Atmospheric Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he had something to say about the conjunction of science and political agendas, which I think is very relevant to this debate. And he said that whenever <clears throat> those with a political agenda found it useful to employ science, he said this, this immediately involves a distortion of science at a very basic level. Namely, science becomes a source of authority rather than a mode of inquiry. The real utility of science stems from the latter. The political utility stems from the former. But the technique is used very heavily in this debate of asserting that it's almost above politics, that this is one of those things that should be determined by the experts. Uh, as a person who served 33 years in the Australian Parliament and um, I'm proud to have identified with the profession of politics all of my adult life, uh, I accept that scientists are experts on science, that judges are experts in interpreting the law, the doctors are expert in keeping us healthy, providing we take their advice, but when it comes to public policy making in a democracy, the elected politicians serving in parliament are the experts. They should be informed on the science, they should be mindful of the economics, but they should never surrender uh, to others the right to make public policy. It never ceases to amaze me how many politicians bemoan the decline in the reputation of their profession, but at the same time almost are busily handing over to other people uh, responsibility for the making of public policy. My attitude on this is of a piece with my long-standing objection to bills of rights I think there are three guarantors of liberty in our kind of society. Uh, the first of those is to have a robust political and parliamentary system. It may on occasions um, uh, frustrate us, uh, it may on occasions embarrass us, but there is no better alternative. We need an independent, incorruptible judiciary, and the third pillar we need is a free and highly sceptical press. If you have those three things, you have a democracy. Uh, I don't favour unelected judges determining social issues. Uh, I have enormous admiration for the United States and many things American, but that admiration does not extend uh, to the way in which their constitution has allowed over the years countless sensitive social and other issues to be determined by uh, unelected judges. Global warming, therefore, is a quintessential public policy issue. And it's important in understanding that issue in its 2013 context to understand the world in which we now live and the prospects we have for the advancement of mankind over the next few decades. According to McKinsey's Global Population Report, and it was prepared for the United Nations, uh, so um, it therefore has a very respectable provenance in this debate, uh, given that the IPCC uh, is uh, a body that operates under the auspices of the United Nations. According to that report prepared last year, by the year 2030, that's just over 16 years from now, there will be 2.2 billion more middle-class consumers in the world than there are now. Uh, and 1.7 of that 2.2 billion will be in Asia. <clears throat> what we're talking about here is lifting about a quarter of the world's population from the tyranny of poverty through economic growth in the short space of less than 20 years. And to me, it's hard to conceive 
a, a more exciting prospect for the world than to bring that about. And you might ask, what's the relevance? What's the context of this for the global warming debate? I think there's an immediate and compelling context and relevance for the global warming debate because nothing should be more important than lifting uh, those billions of people out of poverty and the impact of any global warming policies on the economic growth that is needed to lift them from poverty is very relevant to the debate. I think we would all agree that over the last five years the dynamic of the global warming debate has shifted very significantly. And there have been a number of reasons for this. The first reason has, of course, been the global financial crisis. And to vary, if I may, Irving Kristol's famous uh, remark about being mugged by reality, uh, the global financial crisis has certainly mugged the global warming debate with a heavy dose of reality. Because not only uh, has it forced governments um, uh, to some governments to cut the cost of extravagant alternative energy schemes, but because it's had an impact on world economic activity, it has um, <coughs> coincidentally uh, slowed the growth of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in some countries, which has given some pause for people to reflect <coughs> on the value of the responses they are taking. The collapse of the Copenhagen summit uh, was a very significant event and one that had a, an enormous impact on the debate in my country. It was obvious to me that no serious attempt had been made before that summit to achieve a consensus between the United States and the major emitters from the developing world. And without that, the summit had absolutely no prospect uh, of any kind of success because without uh, a pre-summit understanding between the United States and the major emitters, uh, that was not going to occur. I think it's highly unlikely that we will ever have a compact between the United States and the major emitters. Uh, it is true that in his State of the Union address in February of this year, President Obama committed himself to a cap-and-trade approach. But I think we are further away now than we were some years ago to there being some compact between the developing nations and the United States uh, on uh, global warming. I think it's important to understand that despite what was said in the State of the Union address, that there is a very deep bipartisan opposition in the United States towards that country entering into any kind of worldwide agreement on climate change. The Republicans tend to get all of the bad press on this, but we should recall that in 1998, during the presidency of Bill Clinton, the American Senate voted by 95 to 0 uh, against entering into any worldwide agreement that did not embrace all of the major emitters. It's fair to say that a country like China, which um, is important to all of us and not least Australia because it is now our largest export market and has a voracious appetite for the resources that Providence has been kind enough to, to give us, that countries like China have watched Western industrialised nations achieve the high per capita GDP to which they now rightly aspire through energy uses presently condemned as harmful to the environment. In my view, they have no intention of denying themselves that energy use, which has so manifestly benefited the Western world. Their single greatest goal is economic growth and development and in the process the lifting of more millions of their population uh, from the grip of poverty. And uh, I can understand and sympathise with that and I would ask the rhetorical question, what right has the already affluent West 
to deny them or indeed other countries in that situation the opportunity to enjoy the sort of economic growth that has been so important to the affluence that we now enjoy. I think another factor um, in the change of attitude on the debate has of course been uh, in a variety of ways the, uh, the weakening of the authority of uh, the IPCC. Uh, you've had the flood of emails which you're all aware from the University of East Anglia the admitted errors regarding the Himalayan glaciers. And uh, you've also had uh, some prize examples of people involved in the work of the IPCC admitting the nakedly political character of the agenda uh, they now believe it pursues. Now, I don't suggest that uh, everybody involved in it uh, has embraced a political agenda, and I respect the fact that there are uh, many outstanding scientists who believe that they are doing and are doing in their own way uh, a very proper work of inquiry and I don't make a blanket condemnation of it. But some of you may be aware of, of Otto Edenhopper who was the co-chairman of the IPCC Working Group 3 and he was the lead author of the fourth report released in 2007. And he had this to say and I quote, one has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. And revealing his real agenda, he went on to say, and I quote, one must say clearly that we redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. Now, that's hardly an impeccably impartial um, a well-developed scientific statement. And of course, uh, importantly and finally, the IPCC report uh, most recently released contains a grudging admission that the warming process has been at a standstill for the last 15 years. But perhaps even more important than any of these developments has been the technological change in the last five years. The extraction of oil and gas from shale has had an enormous impact on the American energy scene and it is a game changer in the true sense of that expression. As you all know, gas is cheaper than coal. Natural gas emits 45% less carbon dioxide than coal and costs much less than currently available wind and solar power. In 2012, US emissions of carbon dioxide dropped to their lowest level in 20 years, 14% below their peak in 2007. And I'm sure addressing a British audience that the significance of, of shale to your country and to others uh, will not be lost um, on any of you. As I said in my opening remarks, um, I have been something of an agnostic on this issue um, uh, since I first began to confront it uh, in a serious way as, as Prime Minister some um, close to 10 years ago now. I've never rejected totally the multiple expressions of concern from many eminent scientists, but the history of mankind has told me of his infinite capacity to adapt to changing circumstances of the environment in which he lives. Most in this room will recall the apocalyptic warnings of the Club of Rome uh, some 40 years ago. Uh, they, they were experts. They predicted that the world would run out of resources to sustain itself. They were wrong. Uh, tragically, food shortages still occur, but sadly, many, although not all of them, result from tyrants using starvation as a political weapon. Uh, in Australia in 2004, when uh, my government was still in office, uh, we produced a white paper on energy. And in that white paper, we rejected an emissions trading system. We refused to adopt a mandatory uh, target of 20% of electricity to be sourced from renewables by the year 2020. And that had been recommended to us by a government appointed body uh, in place of the then existing target of only 2.5%. We reaffirmed our opposition to the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol, and most importantly, we said that investment in technology 
should have a higher priority than other measures in dealing with global warming. Now it's interesting that two years on, my government, my government ran into what was really a, a perfect storm uh, on the issue of global warming. And uh, we ended up being far more heavily battered by the storm uh, than uh, our political opponents. To start with, uh, drought, which has been with Australia since the beginning of time, uh, lingered on in many states, particularly in eastern Australia. Uh, severe water restrictions were introduced in Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne, uh, and uh, we thought that drought was never going to end. The bushfire season started early. It often does start early and will start early again in the future. And then we had the um, report by uh, then Sir Nicholas Stern, uh, which had been uh, commissioned by the then British government. Uh, Nicholas Stern came to Australia, uh, uh, I, I think uh, at the invitation of, of people in the uh, Australian Labor Party, but uh, uh, we met and we talked and I listened to what he had to say. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, of course, we had the uh, release of that remarkable documentary called An Inconvenient Truth, uh, which had been authored by Al Gore, to whom I will return in a moment. Um, uh, now, the atmosphere at that time and the political atmosphere was certainly very conducive uh, to people wanting something done about global warming. In late 2006, early 2007, the Australian economy was surging. Uh, unemployment was approaching a 30-year low. Uh, the budget was in very robust condition. We were approaching a position where we would have no net debt and we had uh, produced uh, our 10th budget surplus virtually in a row. And uh, my party's internal political research, and political parties do do a lot of internal research, despite any denials to the contrary from time to time, uh, revealed that such was the optimism of the Australian people about the economic state then, that they virtually believed that the economy ran itself. Uh, and although they had the view that the then government was better at managing the economy than the opposition, in a sense, almost, uh, it didn't matter because the economy was in uh, such uh, tremendous uh, good health. In those circumstances, it was not hard to persuade uh, the public that something more could be done about global warming because, after all, we could afford it. Uh, and our political opponents uh, skillfully exploited this. They argued for ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. And the reason we had resisted ratification was very simple. The way it was structured, it would have imposed burdens on our industries, certain of our industries, like, say, aluminium, uh, that wouldn't have been imposed on uh, countries like China and Indonesia. And uh, for us to have ratified that would have put us at a distinct disadvantage because it would have encouraged investment to bypass Australia and, and flow to these other countries. So they pressed uh, for ratification. Uh, there was a joint task force established between the government, senior bureaucrats and the business community, they recommended an emissions trading system. Uh, we agreed to embrace it because uh, it proposed the protection of our trade-exposed industries and it was on the understanding, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, that we would only um, take it to fruition uh, if uh, uh, there were a worldwide understanding. But that didn't shift the view that the Labor Party in Australia had a more fashionable um, with it position on uh, global warming and the rest, as you know, and they say is history. Uh, we lost that election after 12 years in government and uh, I am of the view that although the main reason we lost was that uh, there was the sentiment that it was time for a change in the modern world being in government for almost 12 years is an eternity. And, uh, uh, it's very, very hard to do. Uh, I think people wanted to change, but I do think the global warming issue or the climate change issue uh, did play a significant role and we, we were certainly seen as being uh, dragging our feet on the issue 
uh, by the population. And initially, uh, there was a sort of a bipartisan approach almost between the government and the opposition on this issue. And then we reached a situation where uh, people in the Liberal Party grew uneasy with that approach. And uh, as a result of that, Tony Abbott challenged for the leadership. He won the leadership ballot by one vote uh, in the parliamentary party. And the issue on which he staked his challenge was opposition to agreeing with the government to have an emissions trading system. He wanted none of that. And um, having got the leadership, he then confronted the incumbent government. <clears throat> the then Prime Minister, Mr Rudd, foolishly, in my view, panicked, uh, deferred the introduction of the ETS, although he had the emissions trading system, I'm sorry, uh, although he had said uh, doing something about the climate was the greatest moral challenge of our age, um, which is a big call, but uh, he did actually say it. Uh, but um, he decided that doing something about the greatest moral challenge of the age um, could um, be deferred for a couple of years, rather put me in mind of the famous injunction of St Augustine, of Lord, make me pure, but not just yet. And uh, uh, it, um, as a result of that, uh, his poll ratings fell. Uh, those in his party who didn't like his style of government used that as an opportunity and they catastrophically for their own political prospects then got rid of him as Prime Minister, although he had yet to complete his first term. And that's a pretty extraordinary thing for any uh, party to do. Uh, and um, we had a dead heat in the 2010 election and as you know, at the last election, the coalition had a very significant victory. Now, my point of just rehearsing that is to undermine, underline the centrality of Tony Abbott's position on global warming uh, and how crucial a part it played uh, in the change in Australian politics and the courage that he demonstrated uh, in doing that. Um, as you know, the, Mr Rudd remained uh, uh, an aspirant for returning to his job and finally in desperation but not in affection uh, he was returned to the leadership two months before the last election but by then the Australian public had decided that they really did uh, need a change of government and uh, they delivered that very emphatically. Australia as you know is a resource rich country uh, as is Canada and we're very lucky and we're very grateful for that. And as a consequence, we have considerable respect uh, for the place of the mining industry in Australia. The mining industry has uh, brought extraordinary wealth to Australia. That's not to say everything it does is accepted uncritically, but we have a realistic appreciation uh, of its contribution. And the Australian public has now elected a government uh, which has a pragmatic approach to the issue of global warming uh, and a determination to treat our mining industry as a prized asset. And uh, the high level of public support for overzealous reaction on global warming has now passed. And my suspicion is that most people in Australia on this issue have settled into a state of sustained agnosticism. Of course the climate is changing, it always has. And uh, there remain mixed views about how sustained that warming is and the relative contributions of mankind and natural causes. But I can assure you that in Australia the views are not mixed about such things as the soaring cost of electricity bills with a growing consciousness that large subsidies are being paid for the production of renewable energy and that this is having uh, an increasingly heavy effect on low-income earners. One of the significant aspects of this debate is that as public opinion has changed, uh, some of the more zealous advocates have become increasingly prone to link any kind of extreme weather event with global warming. Many of you will know that just over two weeks ago we had very severe bushfires uh, on the lower Blue Mountains west of Sydney. Some 200 homes were destroyed. Incidentally, can I 
tell you that the fires were subdued and contained in a quite brilliant fashion by both our professional and volunteer firefighters. And one of those volunteer firefighters was our new Prime Minister. Tony Abbott has been a member of his local volunteer fire brigade for the last 10 years. It was no media stunt and uh, he uh, actually spent some time uh, with his firefighting unit participating in the efforts to contain these bushfires. But my point about the link is this, that uh, Christiana Figuris, who's the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, immediately sought to draw a link between global warming and those bushfires on the Lower Blue Mountains, which was an extraordinary proposition. Uh, her attempt to do so was um, uh, condemned and disputed by both our minister and by the new Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. She said that um, we were all already paying a price for carbon. She tried to have a, a, a bet each way by saying that the direct link between global warming and the bushfires had not been approved yet, but um, she had no doubt that it would be. Uh, but an even bigger gun was brought to bear. Um, the former Vice President Al Gore was interviewed on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's flagship current affairs program at 7.30 on a Tuesday night. He said there was no doubt about the direct link and that Tony Abbott was wrong. Uh, he did say, of course, that he didn't want to interfere in Australian politics, but um, <laughs> um, uh, he, did, he did it with a, with a, with a sigh and um, uh, he had that to say. But that's not the end of the story because um, with exquisite timing, which I'm sure was quite accidental, the following night, the same ABC commenced running an excellent three-part series on the art of Australia, uh, narrated by the just-retired director of the New South Wales Art Gallery, Edmund Capon. And one of the paintings featured in the first episode was an iconic painting of William Strutt entitled Black Thursday. <coughs> and with impressive detail, this depicts a huge bushfire in Victoria which burned out a quarter of the land mass of that state, destroyed one million sheep and claimed the lives of 12 people. And according to the program's narrator, press reports at the time said that the fire was so intense that burning embers from it landed on a ship some 20 miles uh, out to sea. That fire incidentally occurred in 1851 which was 163 years ago, uh, during a period, so we're told, when the planet was not experiencing any global warming. You might well describe all of that as an inconvenient truth. <laughs> <clears throat> now, where, therefore, are we left here in this debate? I think some broad <clears throat> conclusions can be drawn. Firstly, first principles tell us never to accept that all of the science is in on any proposition. Always remain open to the relevance of new research. Secondly, we should keep a sense of proportion, especially when it comes to the issue of intergenerational burden sharing. And I'm especially indebted to Nigel Lawson's um, compelling point in his book, An Appeal to Reason, that the present generation should not carry too heavy a burden so that future generations are only 8.4 times better off rather than 9.4 times wealthier than they are today. And if you think he exaggerates or I exaggerate, even the IPCC estimates that global GDP per capita will increase 14-fold over this century and 24-fold in the developing world. <coughs> Renewable energy sources should always be used when it makes economic sense to do so. 
and no part of the proposition that I've advanced tonight and no part, as I understand it, of the agenda of this foundation suggests that renewables should not be used. It's a question of the capacity to meet the need and the economics of the use of the renewables. Nuclear energy must be part of the long-term response. Uh, I find the passion with which those who have an alarmist point of view on global warming oppose the nuclear industry uh, the most intellectually perplexing of all of their arguments because it's a clean energy source and along with fossil fuel has the capacity to provide base load power and I therefore am at a loss to understand uh, why it should be constantly excluded on intellectual grounds. And modern nuclear power stations have a very sophisticated level of safety. And always, and finally and very importantly, bear in mind that technology will continue to surprise us. I doubt that the expression fracking was widely known, let alone used, five years ago. And can I conclude my remarks on uh, a, an openly and importantly geopolitical note? And uh, as a <coughs> now retired public policy maker, but one who uh, follows public policy debates with continued interest, uh, uh, getting the public policy right on this issue is the ultimate uh, responsibility that we all have. What some people call the shale revolution now underway in the United States has the potential to be a real game changer in the proper sense of that expression. It's still early days, but if the optimists are right, what is happening in relation to shale in the United States has the potential to significantly reduce or even end the energy dependency of the United States on Middle East sources of supply of energy. There can be no doubt that the prospect of that will overshadow any other policy consideration in the United States. And there's equally no doubt that that will be the position in the United States, whether there is a Republican or a Democrat in the White House. I know from the various interactions I've had with, for four years, a Democrat administration under Bill Clinton and seven years a Republican administration under George W. Bush, that the juxtaposition of Middle East politics and uh, the dependency of the United States on Middle East sources uh, of energy is a hugely relevant thing for American policy making. And that factor alone will dominate um, decision making in the United States. So in five years, um, that technological development alone has had an enormous impact and it has the capacity to make a, an even greater impact on the debate in the years to come. Can I finish by <coughs> saying uh, to Nigel Lawson and to his very energetic di executive director uh, that this foundation um, uh, is doing great work. Uh, it's arguing a case. Uh, it's exercising the right of citizens in a democracy to question uh, presumed um, uh, conventional wisdom. Uh, there's no doubt that there has been bullying in this debate. Uh, some of the language I've found offensive. I find particularly offensive the use of the word denier. We all know in modern parlance what that refers to, and it's been used in this debate with a lot of malice of forethought, uh, and uh, not accidentally. Uh, there are, there's little doubt that the debate has changed, the atmosphere has changed, people have become more questioning, but there's also little doubt that there is still a long way to go. And there are large sections of the media who have signed up to uh, the global warming agenda uh, as enunciated by the more alarmist point of view. Uh, that is their right, they can sign up, but it's also the right of others and other sections of the media to question their objectivity. 
but that makes the contribution of a body such as this all the more important. And uh, finally, it's always a, a great pleasure to be in London. The last time I was in London was at the time of the second test at Lord's, <laughs> just a couple of months ago. I didn't find that so enjoyable. <laughs> Although the first test at Trent Bridge had real prospects of being supremely enjoyable uh, uh, until we lost that final wicket, but um, the battle is being resumed and as always it will be a vigorous and fascinating contest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I only have two things to do. The first is to thank you all for coming here this evening, and I'm sure it's an evening that none of you will ever forget. It has been a great occasion. The second thing is to thank John Howard for an outstanding uh, address, an outstanding lecture, an outstanding talk. He is, of course, an outstanding man, but he's done his proud, and, uh, done his proud tonight, and I'm particularly grateful to you, John, for coming a very, very long way, uh, right from the other end of the world, to come and talk to us here this evening. Uh, you mentioned uh, how uh, the, the terrible time you had in 2007 in the election when you lost and when the, the, your, your refusal uh, to sign the Kyoto Protocol was a factor there. I happened to be in, uh, and you said that it was on, your view was not fashionable then. That's true. I happened to be in uh, Sydney on the day of that election. Uh, I'd been in New Zealand delivering a lecture, which was a trial run for the book I subsequently wrote. And on the way back, I stopped off in Sydney and gave a talk to a gathering there, uh, and they very kindly gave me dinner afterwards, a very good dinner. And then after that, I went to my hotel room and turned on the television to see what was happening in the election. And what was happening was there was a, there was a fellow there on the screen who was interviewing a number of voters who had just cast their vote. It was after the polls had closed. And he asked them whether they agreed that Australia should sign the Kyoto Protocol. And almost to a man and a woman, they said yes. And then very cruelly, the interviewer said to them all, what is the Kyoto Protocol? <laughs> and you know, none of them knew. Uh, it was quite clear that it was the politically correct thing to do, and I'm afraid you were a victim of that. It's astonishing that Australians, of all people, should want to be politically correct, but nevertheless, uh, uh, they did. Uh, anyhow, there's been a big change, as you indicated, a great change. And I have to say, we could do with that change in this country. And to assist in that process, we shall be publishing your talk. Thank you. And I hope it will be read by every member of the cabinet, indeed every member of parliament of all parties. And maybe that will be a great contribution to the change we badly need here. So John, thank you very much indeed for coming and talking to us this evening. Thank you.